Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Joseph Boyden. Holy shit, that's a lot of people out here. This is amazing. This is amazing. This is a call to our nation. This is a call to our government. This is a call to the people. It's time. This is also a book launch tonight. Quay standing with our sisters. It's a limited release in, in, in book form. They've got it in back. All proceeds go to Amnesty International. No More Stolen Sisters, which supports our, our, our families and, and getting the message out that this is a national crime and, a, and it's more than a crime, it's a sociological problem in our country. This was put together within three weeks. So, and, and I'm not talking slackers in this book, I'm talking Drew Hayden Taylor, Lee Maracle, Thomas King, Margaret Atwood, Michael Londachi, John Ralston, Saul, the, the list goes on and on. Everyone came to the cause within a week. Within a week of my asking people, they came and gave me original work that they wanted published because they understand what's going on in this country and that we need to make a national inquiry. A, a number of other writers desperately wanted to be here. There just happened to be one woman, not just indigenous North America's probably greatest writer. I don't know if you've heard the name Louise Erdrich before. But she personally wrote this and asked, asked me to read this to you tonight. This is from Louise Erdrich, one of our greatest, greatest writers. Kalinda Waterhen, Maureen writing at the door, Eva Pupasek, Shirley Lone Thunder, Bonnie Jack, Joanne Ghostkeeper, Margaret Forget, Roberta Elders, Joyce Cardinal, Carol Big Tobacco, Daniel Bedard, Marilyn Badger, Adrian Amikins, Teresa Clunark, Bernadette Ahenadu, Helen Osborne, Hilda Agawa, Sharice Houle, Tina Fontaine, these are only a few of our lost sisters' names, most taken from a list compiled by Marianne Pierce. In their names, we hear our grandmothers. In their faces, we see our mothers, our daughters. We see the woman we love and the woman who love us. In their faces, we see the gravity of beauty, the theft of time, the outrage of loss. Tonight, you are standing up for these women. You are here tonight because you do not want a single name added to this list, because you want this to stop. Aboriginal woman, native woman, the original woman of this earth are the source of life. If we do not respect the source of life, what is there to live for? You are here to tell the government, political leaders, that they should be haunted as we all are haunted by the gravity of beauty, the theft of time, the outrage of loss. Their names are on a list. Their words are on the wind. Prime Minister Stephen Harper, they are telling you to listen. Louise Erdrich. Got a couple of buddies behind me that I'm really excited for y'all to meet. Hey boys. My friend Tanya, she's pretty special. She's 39. She's in Inuk from up north. She's the mother of two amazing daughters and she's really smart and good looking. She's an artist and a musician and her talent has found a way to blossom into the lives of many, many people. Tanya travels the world sharing her brilliance, her spirit, her orenda. 
She's taken an ancient and traditional custom of her people and used her throat and her whole body to make something so powerful on the stage that I've witnessed strangers weep uncontrollably or smile like madmen or simply stand and stare with their mouths open or leave the concert. She's that good. Tina Fontaine, she was a special kid. She was 15 from Saiking Reserve and living in Winnipeg. Her father was beaten to death by two drunken friends in 2011. And Tina's family describes how she'd gone into a spiral since then, how she had drifted away from them into the child and family services care in Winnipeg. The family care system there is so overstuffed that Tina was staying in a local hotel with little supervision. It was easy to run away, and so she did. The last time she was spotted was by two cops who pulled over a guy in his pickup truck. 15-year-old Tina was his passenger. Despite her being flagged as a runaway, the cops, they let her go. Not too long after, while searching the Red River for another missing woman, Tina's body was discovered in that river, stuffed into a garbage bag. Tina was a really good student. She loved her family very much. My wife, Amanda, I can claim that she's special. She's 50, although when people hear this, they don't believe it. She's a novelist and a screenwriter. And almost half a lifetime ago, when she was 27, she was brutally raped and left for dead in a Milwaukee neighborhood as she walked to her evening shift at a local bar. The assailant strangled her so hard that her contacts popped out of her eyes. He raped her and tried his best to kill her. And he came close. For a long time after, her skin continued to model and her eyes continued to bleed red. Almost half a lifetime later, that young woman at the wrong place at the wrong time is older and more beautiful and still wonders if that fucker still stalks the streets hunting. My friend Tanya, the artist and musician, was sexually abused through much of her youth. She allows me to tell you this. She's turned the pain into art. In October, the day after performing for the Royal Winnipeg Ballet, a triumphant performance by all accounts, Tanya was followed in broad daylight down the street and verbally assaulted by a white man who made it clear to her that he wanted a fucking Indian girl and she was the one. He went on as she tried to walk quickly away to describe all of the things he was going to do to her. Tanya says she can't count how many times this has happened to her and to most of her friends. Tanya describes her daily experience of simply walking down the street as living in a horror movie, a movie you can't escape from, one that doesn't end. After her treatment by this man, Tanya got back on stage that night and performed triumphantly once again in front of a sold-out audience. Amanda and I were in Winnipeg to watch Tanya perform with the Royal Winnipeg Ballet. This was not so long after Tina Fontaine's body was discovered wrapped in plastic at the bottom of the Red River. As I contemplate this confluence, I believe it might be possible that some small part of Tina is a child in these two women who lived, but I desperately mourn for the life of a young woman not given the chance, not a chance to sing, not a chance to write, not a chance to breathe each day. Hey boys, what are we to do? Hey men! Why don't we question this sickness that beats inside of too many of us? Shall we healthier ones spend our lives staring, not knowing what to do, just stand and look at our shoes or touch our faces and ask forgiveness for horrors we feel no part of? What are we meant to do about this? Do we simply stand by and watch? How will we raise our own boys? I'm sorry.
I'm so sorry, Amanda. I'm so sorry, Tanya. I'm so sorry, Tina. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for a tribe called Red. Give it up for Lido Pimiento on vocals. And give it up for Joseph Boyden. We'll be back in 10 minutes. Have a break, get a drink, get a little talking going on so that you use it up before the second set. We'll see you soon. <laughs>